Okay, I think we can uh, just start. The audience will come. So, hello everyone, and, uh, and thank you for joining this session. I'm uh, David Payton, and it's an honor for me to be uh, the chair of this sustainability and, uh, and learning session. And during this hour, we are going to see uh, five presentations on very interesting papers. And the first one is entitled uh, Expression Adaptation Intent as a Sustainability Goal. And Elias Dieros Tatopoulos is in charge of telling us about it. So, Elias, welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. All right, great. Yep. Uh, let me share my screen. There we go. Okay. Um, thank you. So, this is a joint work uh, together with my colleagues uh, Claudia and uh, Patricia. Um, the motivation of this work uh, has been uh, the realization that um, we have uh, been working uh, in uh, two different areas uh, that are seemingly also not re not related, not connected. That is the self-adapted systems and uh, software sustainability. Um, looking at self-adapted systems, there is a lot of work being done the past years, focusing on different new techniques, on solving specific problems, and some of them also on generalizing those solutions to uh, to uh, to bigger. Uh, uh, patterns. However, um, we really find it very hard to define and analyze the success. So what do we mean by a self-adapted system that changes at runtime and succeeds in its uh, goal or intent, right? So we have different uh, metrics that, uh, that we use as researchers, for example, the number of cases that it recovered from a fault or the number of uh, increase of uh, the percent of increase in performance or the number of uh, deviations in its performance, etc. But uh, essentially, as we're moving forward in this uh, area of building smart systems that change over time, right, it's very important, we believe, to focus on um, what the system should achieve uh, over uh, while, while changing. So uh, in other words, it's very important to look at uh, the intent of uh, self-adaptive systems and uh, try to really model it and take it into account in the engineering of such systems. So the main research question has been in this paper, how can we express the adaptation and its intent at design time, right? So to be able to analyze uh, its possible uh, impact at runtime and over a long period of time. The main novel idea in a very, very short and succinct way is to basically express the adaptation intent of a self-adapted system as the sustainability goal that it needs to satisfy. And this way we also marry these two uh, uh, areas and domains. Sustainability and sustainability goals is something that has been researched in, in uh, terms of uh, software projects uh, the past years. And essentially, it uh, measures the uh, it's a network of quality concerns balanced over time. Um, the, the reason we would like to do that, of course, as I said, is because uh, if we are able to uh, frame the adaptation intent as a sustainability goal, we can get a better grasp on uh, Talking about the endurance and the self uh, and the and the long term success of the self adaptive system. And what we also describe in the paper is uh, this uh, notion of uh, having an adaptation intent, which are uh, which has uh, essentially uh, some boundaries and positive and negative effects. So essentially, an environment change that uh, that triggers an adaptation from the system and vice versa. Uh, basically, they keep this whole uh, intent or the overall quality of the system, if you want, uh, it within uh, certain bounds. Now, our approach uh, is uh, basically to capture um, the features and the quality concerns uh, and also the, the metrics uh, to quantify those quality concerns of a system in uh, a notation that uh, we use in software sustainability projects called decision maps. And based on those maps, uh, to be able to uh, specify uh, and uh, eventually quantify the sustainability goal of the system over time. So I will just uh, give you a, just a glimpse of, uh, of one of the, how does it look, uh, this, this approach or also this um, decision maps. So here we have a self-adapted system. It's an actual an IoT system. And uh, it essentially we capture in this graph that it has, uh, uh, this system has uh, two features uh, that, uh, that can be changed at runtime. We can, uh, the system can tweak uh, the, um, transmitting of uh, uh, transmitting power of a mode, and it can also change the way uh, information is being propagated across modes, right, to reach a gateway. Uh, now, the, the important thing here for us, and while modeling this, is why why do you do this these changes? 
over time. Uh, the first uh, change uh, we uh, we model uh, we model a concern called reliability. So essentially, you would like to change the power setting of the mode in order to uh, affect positively. This is the green arrow here. The concern called reliability of the system. Now uh, the blue, uh, green, and, 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 and other backgrounds we have, they correspond to different types of sustainability concerns. Uh, so uh, that is blue is an economical, and green is a, a, an environmental concern of sustainability, and so on. Uh, so red arrows are negative effects, uh, etc. So having this map, we can uh, uh, look at the sustainability goal uh, as, a, as basically a network of those concerns. So this is what we did, and uh, we actually uh, found out that uh, uh, it is a good starting point, decision maps, to start understanding the trade-offs between the concerns. And uh, we believe that uh, once we are able to quantify uh, the sustainability goal by assigning weights on its quantified concern, we can really uh, reason at runtime about the adaptation boundaries of the system. There, is a, there are a couple of future plans. I think I'm out of time, uh, but uh, uh, we want to collect the adaptation concerns. We want to build some tools. We're actually building some tool support in order to be able to measure those concerns via different metrics at runtime. And of course, we'd like to evaluate our approach with uh, with uh, more and bigger systems. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Elias. So now is the time for the second paper entitled Integrated User Experience in Agile and Experience Report of the New York and Scrum. And Manuel Alahamad is to present us this work. So, Manal, welcome, and it's your time. Uh, we cannot hear you. So you have to... Muted, okay. Yeah, now. <laughs> okay. So, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so hi, uh, I'm Manal Hamad. I'm presenting this paper, uh, which uh, is co authored by my former supervisor, Anna Moreno, who is with us uh, today. And in this paper, we basically report on um, our two year experience in designing and running a novel graduate software engineering course. Um, in this course, we were aiming to uh, integrate user experience um, processes and practices into the agile development process. And this was basically motivated by um, the challenges and also um, the trends in the software industry. Um, so basically, they were trying to um, uh, address some of the uh, issues in Agile by integrating user experience, such as uh, more focus on value creation, more focus on the user. Um, so we noticed that there's a lack of studies and a lack of um, experiences in the academic and training context. And uh, we thought that we could contribute to this um, field by designing a course specifically to integrate user experience into Agile. And we basically um, did two rounds of this course. One was in 2019 and the other was in 2020. Basically, the 2019 was in person and the other one was in online due to the COVID pandemic. And we noticed some slight differences, but we're going to cover this later because uh, of the five minutes uh, limitation. Um, so the course basically covers uh, three parts. We have uh, lectures, traditional lectures on agile development process, and we focus mainly on Scrum. And we have also hands-on exercises such as uh, uh, Scrum City, and we have um, also uh, some uh, Lean UX canvases. So all of them are hands-on exercises on Agile and also Lean UX. And the other part is where the students work on a, a software project uh, following a, an Agile approach. And in our course, they were following Agile with uh, user experience or basically uh, or specifically scrum with user experience. Um, so to do that, to help the students uh, follow this approach, we designed a framework that is built on top of the scrum, uh, scrum framework. And in this framework, which is called GLUX here, so it's a basically a combination of three things. We have uh, scrum with Lean UX uh, tactics or Lean UX practices, along with some gamification techniques. And the main goal of incorporating gamification was because 
uh, we saw the potential of gamification in software engineering education and in software engineering in general, um, and how it improved the engagement and motivation of uh, software practitioners and also uh, software engineering uh, education, uh, sorry, uh, students. So the Linux tactics that we integrated into Scrum were basically five tactics. We have uh, hypotheses, design studio, experiment stories, uh, an MVP, and weekly user experiments. And basically, the team um, follows this framework uh, by starting with brainstorming some hypotheses, which represent the uh, team's assumptions of what is valuable to the user. So they start with an assumption, and then they design um, these um, uh, assumptions or the, the features that they assume that it's valuable for the user. And then they start the sprint planning as usual in Scrum. And within the sprint planning, uh, they have to also plan for a weekly user experiment, uh, which is captured in what is called the experiment stories. And basically what they do in these weekly user experiments is that they ensure that they have this constant feedback from the user about what is what they're working on uh, early on in, in, in the process when the sprint before they uh, deliver the increment. And the MVP is basically to help them have these this initial uh, version of the, of the product. So uh, the students followed this uh, approach for uh, two years in the project and we had some, uh, we learned a lot of things, honestly, but these are like the main lessons that we've learned uh, in, in, from running the course. Um, so basically, we collected data through questionnaires, uh, unstructured interviews, and also we analyzed the students' project reports. And the main lessons uh, were basically we found uh, that integrating uh, UX into Agile can be very, very challenging when, uh, when we have like short sprints. And in our course, we had only one week sprint, and that was extremely challenging for the students because not only the sprint is short, but because we have we have only one team that designs and develops, so we don't have separate teams. Uh, so it was a lot to them. Uh, also, learning Agile with Linux and the integration of the two processes uh, were very overwhelming for the students because not all of the students had uh, this experience or prior experience in Agile uh, or Linux. Actually, um, maybe only one of them had this uh, uh, in prior experience in Lean X and uh, with Agile, we had some, but it's still uh, not um, a good uh, or a very deep experience with Agile. We also found like, that one of the um, uh, uh, most challenging tactics or concepts from the Lean UX process for the students to grasp or to understand was the hypothesis concept. So the hypothesis, basically, they focus more on the value for the business and the value for the user. And for software engineers, we are used to focus on um, uh, what is valuable to the user to some extent, but we don't think a lot about, about the business uh, aspect. So that was very challenging for the students to understand. And we also found that uh, the very high collaboration level in Linux, so Linux encourages collaboration in every tactic. So for brainstorming the hypothesis, the whole team should participate in terms of uh, developers, designers, uh, project managers, product managers, everyone should be involved in this brainstorming session and also in the design studio and the rest of the steps. And the, the reason behind this uh, emphasis of uh, collaboration in Linux is because they wanted to have uh, or to uh, make the team have this shared understanding of everything that's going on in the product um, just to decrease the um, uh, misunderstanding or miscommunication. So when they work on every uh, tactic, uh, the communication will be better and faster. Uh, so they don't have to have like a lot or uh, the issues will be less. Um, also, we found that um, integrating linear acts and scrum uh, can be an abstract process for the students um, because the students, they like this experience of agile and also integrating user experience into agile. Uh, they had a lot of questions about uh, specifically about how how uh, Lean UX tactics or user experience uh, uh, practices can be incorporated into, for example, the product backlog. Um, so the ways to handle this was not clear to the students and we had to guide them through uh, uh, every step of the process. Um, and lastly, we found that um, when designed properly, uh, gamification can be effective in engaging the students in the development uh, process. Um, although it was not straightforward, to be honest, uh, but we found that um, rewards and achievements 
uh, can be very engaging to the students um, and can help them to actually have a, uh, a motivated experience creating uh, user experience uh, tactics and practices into the development process. Because as you know, incorporating these practices can actually add more uh, load, but it can lead to uh, a better quality uh, uh, software. Um, so we use gamification for that purpose, uh, just to try to take the edge off these all of these things integrated together. Um, so that's basically our experience. Um, uh, the Glux framework was uh, published in a different uh, study, and we had this uh, study uh, based on on uh, on that study. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Mana. So we continue with the third paper. Data respond to change of diet and educational scrum simulation for distributed teams. Emily Christensen is one of the authors who is going to tell us how So, Emily, welcome, and we are looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I'm Emily Christensen from IT University in Copenhagen. And this paper is a joint work with Maria Pasvaria from Lut University in Finland. So in this study, we are going to present our experiences and results on an online scrum simulation for distributed teams. And it was created in a multiplayer game, Don't Start Together. So the way companies work has recently been reshaped and it seems clear that uh, distributed software development is here to stay. So we need to be able to train our students to use Agile and Scrum in distributed settings. The simulation, it was designed in uh, February 2020. And in this study, we share our findings on how the Don't Starve Together Scrum simulation works and what the student learning outcomes are. So Don't Starve Together is a wilderness survival game. Players need to explore an unknown world and use the affordances provided in the game and try to avoid death. Staying alive in Don't Starve Together, it requires constant and careful maintenance and there are no tutorials or rules or points or specific objectives in this game. Um, while most virtual game worlds, they're designed to support a very specific uh, type of game, sandbox games in which the players, they can more or less run freely and roam the world, they can be described as digital playgrounds. And Don't Start Together is an ideal digital playground for the simulation because it's an environmentally realistic open world sandbox game. The main goal of the Scrum simulation is to provide a digital play space where participants, they can learn Scrum in practice while at the same time providing an opportunity for team building. So the scrum teams, they carry out a mini scrum project and keep track of their progress during the simulation, primarily in Don't Starve Together. Our research questions for this study are what were the main learning outcomes of the Don't Starve Scrum simulation as reported by the students? Uh, what were the experiences and perceptions of the participants on the Don't Starve Together Scrum simulation? and how could the simulation be further improved to enhance learning opportunities. In our study, we applied the method critical making, and this combines critical thinking with iterative goal-based material work. And the three stages of this method were carried out over the duration of one year. We ran the simulation 25 times in total with 244 participants, and this included both students from eight different universities, as well as industry product owners and agile coaches. And we analyzed 196 student learning diaries and 84 student survey responses and held a retrospective meeting with product owners and agile coaches who had participated in the simulation to collect feedback. The main learning outcomes as reported in the student learning diaries were communication, estimation, scrum and practice, communication and collaboration with the product owner specifically, scrum events, work organization, teamwork, and prioritization. The survey results were primarily positive and they indicate that a majority of the students learned how to use or apply agile scrum, agile and, uh, scrum topics in practice and could apply what the topics were. 
and or had heard about the topics during the simulation. So in this study, we presented a digital playful simulation for teaching Agile and Scrum that can be used in distributed online settings, the Don't Starve Together Scrum simulation. None of the previously reported games for teaching Agile and Scrum were designed for a distributed online teaching environment. So the simulation we present in our study is a unique tool for online teaching. In addition, the inclusion of the industry product owner in two of the courses provided an opportunity for team building within the Scrum teams. And many of the students reported that the experience would help improve their collaboration and the success of their team projects. So the results of this work show how the Don't Starve Together Scrum simulation can provide valuable learning opportunities for students and an enjoyable, playable digital experience for all participants. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. So the next paper is titled Towards a Green Quotient and Force of Web Projects. Rohit Mera is going to present this work. So Rohit, welcome and looking forward to hearing from you. Good day, everyone. I hope my screen and audio is coming out fine. Yeah, everything is okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm Rohit Mehra. I'm a senior researcher in the application engineering R&D group here at Accenture Labs in India. And in this paper, we'll be discussing the challenges uh, which restricts the adoption of sustainability practices uh, in the industry. And when we say sustainability practices, we in most of the cases, we would be meaning energy consumption of software systems. So let's get started with how much energy consumption does the ICT industry, does the in information communication industry right now consume? So currently, about 2% of the global greenhouse gas emissions quota accounts for just from the ICT domain. Now, this can be attributed, or the major chunk of this can be attributed to the design, development, distribution of software systems, and definitely the massive infrastructure required to run that. So your data sensors, your network providers, and everything in between. Just to give you an example about the scale of this problem, just one blockchain that exists out there, the Bitcoin blockchain, consumes more energy than the entire country of Argentina with a population of 40 million people. That's the scale of this particular problem. And there are a lot of estimates which, which typically talk about that by 2040, this number is going to increase to 14%. A lot, lot of estimates basically claim that. And uh, that, that could be a massive jump in over next say next 20 years. And if nothing then to control this, this could be a huge problem. Now, though the con concept of software sustainability has existed for a while now, but its industry adoption is still very, very limited. So for example, as per again, multiple studies, developers focus on more on software aspects like code quality, performance, bug resolution, but optimizing software system from a perspective of software sustainability is still very low. And we have a point of view on why this is the case and why the industry, and in saying more case cases, even academia, is not focusing on adopting sustainable software design practices. So again, we'll not be going too deep into this just because this is a two or five minute talk. But say the major points are first is the lack of awareness. Like even when I was in university or even you were in university, there were courses on optimizing software system from a quality perspective, from performance perspective, timing, cost, but there were no courses related to software sustainability on how to improve the energy consumption of a software system. Suppose I'm a project manager who wants to incorporate this kind of a software sustainability into my project. Currently, I don't even know the first step in taking the journey forward. That is what we refer to as lack of awareness. Moreover, most of the approaches that exist even today are very, very intrusive. So suppose, say a paper discussing about uh, impact of design patterns on the energy consumption of a particular code. But it focuses on a very specific problem of a design pattern. Okay. Now, even if, say, the paper says that this particular design pattern increases the energy consumption by, say, X percentage, is removing that design pattern from your code the ideal solution? Typically not, because removing that particular design pattern might impact other areas in your code, say its readability, its maintainability, its robustness, or, or maybe any other concern. There was a reason you introduced a design pattern in your code base. Moreover, most of the focus areas currently uh, that researchers are looking at are very, very siloed. In that sense, that we are focusing only on the technology aspects of things and say other aspects like um, processes, teams, your metrics, are basically often overlooked when we talk about software sustainability. Also, there are no, or say, a, a wide dearth of these software-related sustainability metrics. Okay, 
and moreover people don't like developers don't really understand these metrics from a sustainability point of view like your typical metrics like uh, carbon dioxide equivalents and and so on so lack of that metrics does not allow you to gauge a holistic overview of your entire project landscape your entire software landscape and then can does not allow you to give a 360 degree overview of how you are doing from a sustainability perspective now all of that is usually hidden why because nobody can realize the impact of these sustainability decisions that they are making like say if i'm talking about quality or performance of a software system or timing that it takes a software system to run all of that can be visualized by the developer himself but sustainability or energy consumption is something that he cannot really understand at that point in time because you are running the software system it is running the underlying hardware the energy consumption or the energy generation is being done at the power plant that is where the actual carbon emissions are being generated but that is not something that you can really see from your naked eyes that is why that hidden impact does not really allow you to gauge gain a whole, holistic perspective into this to overcome a few of these challenges uh, we are working on a novel novel metric called project green cushion which is in a sense a scoring between 0 and 1 so we basically give the end user a questionnaire currently that exists of about say 40 questions and by answering to those 40 questions at the start of the project the end team can gauge that what is the impact on the software system or the sustainability of the software system because of the decisions that you're going to take in that particular journey say for example selecting a language between java or python or say selecting a user experience between having a white background versus a dark background what impact it can have so that's a score that we generate from a scale of 0 to 1 and uh, eventually we give a lot give, depending upon the responses we give a lot of analytics and recommendation back to the team so that they know what are the imp sustainability impact of their design decisions that they are making and how to improve upon that so in summary let's try to be cognizant of and be very more responsible in the way we are designing and developing software systems so that it does not end up harming the planet more than doing good thank you for listening to my talk Thank you, Rohit. And uh, we have already reached the last paper of this session, entitled "Green AI: Do Deep Learning Frameworks Have Different Costs?" And we have uh, Stefano Giorgio to present us, this work to us. So, uh, Stefano, welcome. And we're going to start your presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you see Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, all. This is Stefano Giorgio, and today I would like to present to you the study I have prepared with my colleagues. This is a study we compare deep learning frameworks with respect to their energy and runtime performance and we try to point out which are more energy and runtime performance efficient for training different deep learning models. The reason why such studies is important is because huge amount of energy is being used on daily basis to train models. Different deep learning frameworks cannot put different energy and runtime performance and we would like to know how much is this difference. Moreover, With this study we can suggest which frameworks to use on specific cases. Uh, specifically we aim to answer the following research question like which is the most energy runtime performance efficient framework for our models? How much accuracy is being sacrificed to have energy and runtime performance efficiency? And which are the most demanding API calls for the corresponding frameworks? We use six models coming from three distinct categories in this study that are available from Nvidia's publicly available repository named Deep Learning Examples. Although we have selected only six models implemented in two frameworks, which are TensorFlow and PyTorch, since these are the most popular according to research studies, uh, it took us more than a month to collect our data. Overall, the three categories we have is, are the recommender systems, natural language processing, and uh, computer vision. To collect our measurements, we used Perf command line tool and NVIDIA's SMI. Moreover, we built a framework named PRENGDL that is publicly available on GitHub, but works only on Debian-based systems equipped with NVIDIA cards. For our first research question, we find that training for training models, TensorFlow is well established for computer vision and recommender system tasks, while PyTorch performs better for natural language processing tasks regarding their energy runtime performance. Uh, about the model's inference, we find that TensorFlow is more efficient for recommender system and only for ResNet 50, which is a task for computer vision, while PyTorch for the remaining ones. Overall, TensorFlow is more energy efficient, runtime performance efficient for training uh, the models we have selected for this study. 
For our second research question, our results suggest that energy and runtime performance efficiency of the models are more accurate uh, also in most of the cases. So those that are more efficient are also more accurate, surprisingly. Uh, however, we only used one set of hyperparameters for this research question, and we do not know how much, how different hyperparameters will affect the outcome. Uh, definitely more uh, recent investigation will be needed uh, in this direction in future. About our last research question, we provide the whole graphs of our programs using the C profile of Python. After collecting the functions that are responsible of taking the most time uh, while training and inferencing the models, we performed a manual analysis to figure out the reasons why there are these inefficiencies. Therefore, myself and the second author of this study went through the code and manually pointed out the reasons uh, and at the end, we had a discussion to reach a conclusion. Uh, we find that both PyTorch and TensorFlow suffer from specific API calls that are more costly than others. For instance, like Py, uh, PyTorch autogrant backwards, for example. Uh, in general, this study raises awareness on the fact that different deep learning frameworks incur different energy and runtime performance for the training and the inference phases. Moreover, no framework is best for all the selected tasks, and this fact, fact calls for actions to allow users to consider and understand an anterior runtime performance requirements when selecting a deep learning framework. The deficiencies we found in the current documentation of deep learning frameworks reveal the need of a new green aware documentation for uh, deep learning frameworks and the way to benchmark the API calls as well in order to raise energy awareness. Also, Testing small models regarding energy consumption uh, before running a large scale experiment and providing the estimated resource usage can help in selecting the most energy friendly solutions. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Stefanos. Um, thank you all very much for your presentations and sharing with us these uh, works. Now it's time for the discussion panel for questions and answers. Uh, please, both audience and uh, Presenters, feel free to ask any of the presenters. I think we have, yeah, we have some questions uh, in chat from first from Kusal Ramkumar. Uh, I think Elias has already answered the question from Kusal, but if you want to to add something, uh, please uh, feel free to do it. And uh, well, the second question from Kusal is uh, for Manal. Uh, do you think integrating UX into Agile was difficult due to, first, the lack of uh, Agile experience, and second, the sort of one-week sprint? And uh, it was a lot for a cross-functional teaming with UI en engineers, and we found a two-week sprint to be quite efficient. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting question, because if you think about it, um, it's actually a combination of factors. It's not only one factor that you would say, this factor caused it to be difficult. Uh, but both uh, the lack of experience in Agile and also the lack of knowledge or experience in user experience or LimeX in particular, uh, contributes to these challenges or these difficulties. And when the LinuX process was uh, initially envisioned, uh, the authors actually um, uh, had this two week uh, uh, sprint in mind because they assumed that, okay, uh, one week or the first week we'd go for discovery and experimentation. And the second week we will be able to actually deliver an increment. But with one week, you have like a very, very short um, uh, time to do your discovery, to do your design and to deliver something and also experiment that thing that you delivered and get some feedback and then improve it and then deliver it again. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. Uh, and also it gets easier, I think, uh, when you have um, uh, dedicated people for uh, user experience or for uh, UI design, because um, in that case, they will do most of the work even if developers and software engineers, they contribute in the discussion and in the improvement of these designs or these decisions, still most of the work is done by the team or the UX team or the design team. Um, so I think having two week, exper uh, two week sprint and also having separate uh, teams or cross-functional team uh, will help a lot in mitigating or in, um, improving these challenges. I hope it's clear. Um, 
kushal yes thanks but w- one um, follow up that is you think that you found ux uh, to be difficult to integrate into agile given the constraints of say lack of experience and just the one week sprint or is integrating ux into agile itself a problem from what you see yeah um from my perspective i think it proposes a challenge even though you have uh, experience in agile and ux you still have uh, this um, extra work or extra focus that you will do so it's going to have some challenging impact on the development process but we have to think about the uh, end result of this integration and the end result would be improving the quality of the software and ensuring that the end user would get the uh, value or the um, the um, software that he really needs instead of just building increments and building functionalities without having any basis of whether this uh, increment of functionality is actually valuable or important to the end user. Um, and also we have to think about uh, the user uh, perspective as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's from my own perspective and also from, from the literature because the literature still focuses or um, discusses how the integration of uh, UX and agile is challenging even in an industrial context with uh, experienced uh, people. Uh, but I think they're trying to make this um, integration less challenging, giving the uh, benefit that we will get from uh, integrating both uh, areas. Got it. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, Patricia asks to Rohit about the issue of software sustainability. Um, uh, uh, can you, because yep. you have a discussion yeah, in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think Patricia, um, uh, I, I think I think the first part of the question was already uh, clear. Sorry for uh, reconvening that. Uh, second part, what I mean is improving. Okay. Yes. So yes, you cannot uh, keep on improving environmental uh, safe, uh, sustainability forever. Yes. But that is not the intent of this particular project. The intent of this particular project is to allow the project managers or the designers or the architects to have a high level overview of, of the design decisions that they're making before even they start working on the project. So that is the high level intent for this particular project so that they can answer a few questions and figure out whether they have taken the right decisions towards the software sustainability, towards the greenness of the software aspects or not. And if not, then it will uh, raise them some alarms, it basically, basically give them some recommendations, some ideas as to, okay, that these are the few aspects where you are not really considering sustainability. And then these are the ways where you using which you can consider sustainability in your projects because they don't have any information prior to say working on that project about what software sustainability is. Uh, say, 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 what kind of languages do you choose if you want to make a software system more energy efficient? What kind of color schemes do you choose? And so on. So that is where this, this project, this particular tools helps them. So it's more of a uh, awareness kind of a tool rather than evaluating the tool after the tool is built. Yeah, if that helps. Yeah, to continue with you, Rohit, um, where do you think is the root of the problem that sustainable software is not being developed nowadays? That is, uh, what should we change urgently and where to achieve uh, uh, sustainable software? So I think sustainable software, is, first of all, can be achieved anywhere. Okay, like we are focusing a lot, uh, like, like, like a lot of our R&D, uh, so on the perspective of software that are running on virtual machines, on servers, the main pain areas that we are witnessing is that there's a lack or basically dearth of tools that are available. Okay, so without the right tooling support, you cannot really visualize or you cannot really comprehend at how much energy your software system is currently consuming. And without that information, you don't have a really good understanding about how you can optimize the software system going forward. What are the good energy patterns that you can opt for? What are the good coding practices that you can opt for? And without that information, it's very hard to figure out that, okay, whether the right changes that you're making to your code base or your software system is actually making an impact or not. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, well, a question from Manal to Stefanos. Yeah, uh, about the question, uh, it's not like we provide guidelines how to improve the models. We maybe provide guidelines on which to select, which deep learning framework to select uh, for training specific models, because you can sing a significant amount of energy and the magnitude of differences are large. 
uh, consider if you're running an experiment which could take up to days, making a simple selection of a framework can help you with a very simple solution to save a lot of energy and definitely run time. Um, about results, we have some results in our study. However, we only selected two frameworks and although with six months, it took us more than a month to collect data. Uh, there are more frameworks out there. However, we decided to select uh, models created from NVIDIA and maintained by NVIDIA because uh, to avoid uh, implementation biases. Uh, did I answer that question or should I try more? No, clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the, about the second question. Oh, yeah, about the device we use. Uh, and how did you find difference between energy consumption and test of flow laptop between you? So we just use one device, a server device, uh, to run our experiments. Uh, we wrote that wealthy. So we had the server device with uh, NVIDIA Quattro P4000, which has an eight gigabyte of RAM. We do not, and but uh, NVIDIA, uh, who provided the repository, had uh, DXG1. Uh, they are equipped with maybe eight GPU cards uh, with over 30 uh, with 32 gigabytes of RAM each while we had just eight. Uh, we had also like 72 uh, logical cores. And at some point we had to reduce some of the configurations in order to be able to run training and inference of models like multiple times, 10 times to get statistically correct results in order to find the significance in the magnitude. Uh, so yeah, I mean, maybe if we test this on a, on different devices that, that are equipped with much more stronger, uh, equ equipment or hardware, maybe the result will not be the same. I'm not sure, but maybe, uh, and this shows also that it's, uh, not very easy to do such uh, studies, uh, due to the need of an expert of expensive hardware. Yeah, that, that's true. Actually, that, that's another reason why I also asked about the TPUs because the tensor processing units are supposed to be Google's way of, I mean, telling that's the best way to run <laughs> TensorFlow uh, algorithms. I was just curious if you looked into that. No, no, we didn't have such a, the, unfortunately, such a computer system in our arsenal. So we had to work with what we had. Um, but uh, what, what we, our aim here is just to show that just selecting a framework, you can make a, a huge difference. And it's better to run a small experience at the beginning to compare two or three frameworks and then go for the long run. I think in the long term, it can bring savings, monetary and environmental in a way as well. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, and Stefanos, in addition to energy consumption, do you think this is important to the, the heat generation? Since, uh, for example, the more heat, the more heat to for cooling, and therefore the more consumption. And I think it will be interesting to see that comparison. You've been cutting off a bit for my, on my end. Uh, Sorry? You, 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 are cut, yeah, you are cutting off uh, on my end. I couldn't hear you clearly. Could you repeat that? Yeah, if you think that it is important to consider the heat generated by the system. Ah, the heat. Yeah. Uh, well, that's definitely a parameter, uh, the heat. But again, it depends on the environment where a computer system is running. Um, I, I mean, if I do an experiment on a, one server device, I will think if there is too much heat in the computer system, the dynamic voltage frequency scaling of the CPU will reduce the frequency in order not to, to heat up too much the CPU. So eventually, this will eventually, in a way, indirectly will affect our results. Maybe the execution time will be slower. Or is this what you are uh, thinking about? Yeah, more or less. Yeah. More or less, yeah. And maybe it should be uh, an additional parameter that we should start considering in our measurements. Like, uh, we have to first investigate how the heat in a computer system will affect the energy and the performance, and maybe to have it also a parameter that could affect. It's a physical parameter, but in a physical sense, it will affect, yeah, definitely. Exactly. It depends how long it will run our experiments and depends on different factors, again. Yeah. Okay, Elias wants to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, to Stefan as well, um, yeah. I, I looked at the paper, uh, interesting work. I was thinking, uh, wondering, um, 
where to go from from here i mean from your results what i can say is that you cannot really sele select one framework uh yeah. you can calls right uh, but you cannot really say so i was thinking uh, as it is in any contextual uh, rich problem right there's no uh, big win uh, from just going uh, blindly so i was thinking could you re use some of your results uh, to extrapolate into some kind of uh, patterns about the data set or the uh, the learning uh, task that you want to do in order to mm -hmm. warn the developer in a form of for example a unit test for energy for, for DL, so that would be pretty cool. Uh, I had some discussion about this with uh, Luis Cruz from uh, TU Delft. Uh, they were doing some study about the how the data set could affect uh, the yes. results. And I was also suggesting maybe a, a, another way. One of the big problem with energy is you have different computer systems, so it may affect, one framework could affect different ways. Uh, yeah, so, my my way of my way of thinking is that these companies they may try to build different unit tests to test their API calls, benchmark it, and add it also in the documentation to see in a relative way how much energy is being used on different uh, API calls to and maybe even recommendation system to recommend to users which API calls to use or how to use it, what they should be careful like if I use huge data set of complexes would take too much energy. So maybe act in a different way. So I, I, you're missing I, guidelines, on, sorry, documentation. I think it's smart because because this way you can say, for instance, looking at the data set that this needs uh, so many API calls of this kind. And if you know kind of the unit of this API call, then you can really start saying something about this is the expected energy. So that would be also an interesting study, like expected versus actual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, then, yeah. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for you, Elias. Um, you have said that you are building a tool to evaluate the, the, the adaptation of a system with respect to sustainability. And I think that too, too could affect the performance of a system, especially at a runtime. So have you thought about how it should be implemented to avoid the, the, this impact or to reduce it? Sorry, I also kind of lost you there for a second. Uh, so, sorry, I couldn't hear all of it. Yeah, you're building a uh, tool to evaluate uh, the adaptation of a system with respect to, to sustainability, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this tool could affect the, the performance of the system in uh, runtime. Yes. Because you are evaluating in runtime. So I see. Have you thought about uh, how to implement yeah. it? I, I I understand. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is true. This is uh, this this happens always when you um, well monitor uh, also just just to evaluate your sustainability index as we want to do, uh, but also in order to take some action, right? So there is a monitoring overhead always, and this is something that uh, we haven't looked specifically into, but. Uh, of course, when you start uh, monitoring uh, uh, and, and you try to really create an index uh, that is very complex because it's composed of several aspects that have to be weighted together, uh, then uh, of course you have to be careful about the runtime overhead you incur to the system. Yeah, it is a problem. However, with all these kind of uh, runtime adaptations and uh, monitoring, yes. Can I can I add something to that? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we did indeed in other works uh, uh, evaluate the cost of adaptation. I think you were indeed going to that. Uh, in not, not always the cost of adaptation is uh, significant. In some cases, it's negligible. For instance, experiments in mobile apps for healthcare uh, show that uh, uh, in some cases it's negligible. And then uh, in this respect, you have a sustainable adaptation whenever the, basically the return on the investment, so the, the cost of adaptation is much lower than the advantage of having an adaptive system. And then you, you have the trade-off in, in that the cost of adapting and then the, 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 the benefit of having a technically sustainable system. Yeah, thank you, Patrizia. And uh, well, I have a question for Emily. 
I found your paper very interesting, but I would have liked to see in the detail what challenges you have had faced when applying your proposal, in addition to some, to some uh, that you have included about data collection, since in the end are lessons learned that serve when creating a proposal. For example, since it is software that the students have to run on their computers, uh, have you faced challenges such, such as pro running the game or, or similar? So you were breaking up a little bit there. I understood the question as technical challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we did experience that a few of the students had some technical challenges um, installing the software, uh, that kind of thing. For the most part, however, the students um, figured it out. It was challenging for the industry partners than the students. So that was something we, um, yeah, are working on improving. <laughs> okay, thank you. So do we have more questions from the audience or presenters? I, I have one for you, yes. Uh, about the self adaptation system, uh, you are thinking also like patterns like um, maybe if the heat is too much or if I use multiple of course and the out expected output is not, not the expected, maybe I should try to reduce or adapt my, in a way, my software to use less course. So is it something that you can possibly do dynamically? like? handle resources dynamically, uh, you have some expected output and the actual and adapt it in such way. Yes, it's a good uh, example. That, it, that depends on the, on the, on the system, right? So uh, yeah, in, always. In also, well, whether you actually have the capability of changing the course, uh, that depends on the, on the architecture you use, but technically, but it's, uh, in, well, we were looking at it from more from a perspective of how can you model those capabilities? Right, and uh, how, what can you start saying about uh, the effect of doing an action at runtime, and the counter effect mm -hmm. right, of, of not doing an action? Uh, because, as you know, as you also saw in your study, I think uh, you uh, cannot have best energy, best performance, best, best, best. So basically, you have trade-offs, uh, and then you basically can uh, start steering your system one way or another, and then you have to decide: mm -hmm. Do I go for maximum energy, or do I go for maximum performance? at runtime and this is very interesting if you consider not static rules in our systems but more like systems that learn in, in a reinforcement learning setting for instance where you have really an agent and the environment is, uh, is the system that you learn with and uh, there it becomes very crucial to set up the right reward function so we, we, we were thinking how to do this reward function how to really create a reward function that is promotes the sustainability or ensures the sustainability but yes, your example is, is a good one uh, because it shows this trade. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, one more question for you, Stefanos. Yeah. Uh, what measures do you think are most important to implement when programming deep learning algorithms or even software in general? How should that code be? You mean what, what mess, what code they should? Can you repeat How that? How what? should that the, the code be, you know? The how code, code be. Yeah. Oh, how to code. Well, well, well. Oh, well, I, I did some study back uh, a few years ago uh, when I was comparing different programming languages in energy consumption in MSR. Um, if you're asking about code practices, uh, I would say that maybe selecting also programming language can make a difference. However, as far as I know, most of the frameworks they are using C++ libraries, which are very efficient. I, I wouldn't be able to suggest now such practices, maybe just say profile more your functions and try to improve them, try to figure out how we can improve them. Uh, but again, what we do not have, I, I think as a community and we're liking of, are tools to show the energy consumption per module, per function. I know for Android there are a few. I'm not sure about computer systems uh, like desktop servers, they are. So I think just to go to the improvement, we need first to have the tools to measure it, and then we can focus on improvement. So that is, will be the first step. Now, uh, if, there, if someone knows such tools, please 
uh, say them. The, the, can I also add some, one, one thought to this? Because I, I believe that um, uh, Stefan is, is, is important, of course, but also the decision to even try to improve has to be somehow quantified and taken into account, right? Because if you have, like, let's say, 90% performance, sometimes we might blindly say, we have the resources, let's do it. Let's try mm -hmm. to increase the, 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 the accuracy or the recall or whatever, but we might not need it. And, and this is something that we will never know uh, until we actually somehow take it into account in the decision process of the organization, of the project, of, of, of. so it is even, I would, I would argue, even in research projects, sometimes it's questionable whether to, why to kind of try to increase the accuracy when we have to do one week more of experiments, when we know from your studies and similar that this takes a, a toll, right? <laughs> well, again, it depends what you need. Uh, maybe just uh, a function where you can select uh, runtime performance, uh, balance, and energy efficiency. And we choose based on the system. If it's a risk critical system, then you meet runtime performance. It will not cut as much. So it's, again, decisions. Uh, you cannot yeah. have all, as you said. That's really interesting. Thank you for your discussion. Uh, do we have more more questions? Well, I think uh, this last five minutes we can have a break for, for the next session. So thank you very much all for joining the, the, the session and join the conference and we wish you a nice day. Thank, thank you. you all. Have a good day. Yeah, have a good Bye. day.